Good morning. Welcome to worship with Hillier Memorial Christian Church. It is a gift to be here, gathered even in our separate places, together to worship. We serve one God who is in every place at all time. And so it is fitting that even though we are in many places, we too can still gather and can worship our God together. If you are visiting with us, Know that we are so glad to have you as part of our community this morning. We would welcome the opportunity to connect with you, either in person or virtually, depending on whether you're located in the Raleigh area or not. You can reach out to us by sending us an email to info at hillierchurch.org. We would welcome the opportunity to be in prayer with you and for you. We invite you to gather some communion elements as we celebrate that special meal together later in the service. And also invite you as you are able to consider supporting Hillier's mission and ministry through your tithes and offerings, which you can do online at any time at hillierchurch.org slash give. In the time that we're going to share, let us enter into a time of prayer. As we have a few moments of silence, let us think about our country, our world, um, wildfires and, and uh, hurricanes, uh, beginning of a season as well, uh, some unstable weather. And so we think about those things, but we think about the calls for peace all over um, the world and people in our own congregation that we would want to hold close and uh, seek God's uh, gifts of comfort and peace and strength and healing. So let us be in a spirit of prayer. Eternal God, draw near to us again to teach, to guide, to sustain by opening our eyes to wonders and mysteries that find their resolution at last in our ties with you, by the gratitude that blossoms in our hearts, by the exacting uses of life that an active conscience forces us to undertake by strong ties of wholesome friendships, by the shame we feel over missed opportunities or those that we have misused, by the bitter lessons of experience, by second chances 
that have given us um, uh, new opportunities in most circumstances by all of the good memories and genuine hopes that come to us by every impulse to do our best for the sake of others, by the abiding memory of Jesus on this earth and his continuing presence with us in this world. And so draw near to us, O God, in every circumstance. We remember unto you with mixtures of shame and pride those events in, in our communities that, that have uh, not uh, led us to be the kinds of people that, that we would want to be, those things that we have ignored, those things that we have allowed to pass without protest. Again, O oh God, in every corner of the world it would seem, cries go up, tragedies, pain, innocence hurt, thousands lost, the energies of lifetime shattered in moments. So be the good shepherd in the midst of pain and rubble and stir our hearts to both care and serve. Keep close to you those who sorrow in these days without relief and lead them toward the depths of faith and hope and love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. morning we uh, move our find our way outside the book of Genesis back into uh, the Gospels not actually today from the the Gospel of Matthew which is our gospel for the year but uh, something that caught my attention out of the Gospel of Luke and so I want to read um, to you from uh, the 14th chapter of the third gospel verses 1 and then continuing in 7 to 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down in the place of honor. In case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited you both um, may come to you and say, give this person your place, and then in disgrace you will start to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit with you at the table. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. <clears throat> well, you know, I've been preaching for um, quite a few years now, and my experience is that congregations, people, people in congregations, um, they may make polite, polite uh, chit-chat at the door when they are making their way out of the sanctuary. They may pat you on the back and, and say, well done. But generally speaking, um, I don't know that people are actually racing to get home to try out whatever advice that I have pitched in that sermon. Um, on occasion, it will happen that somebody will share with me that they have been extremely moved by my words, by, by the sermon. But um, usually after a few days pass, they, they get over it, you know, and uh, before long, everything's sort of back to normal. So my experience of how people are going to um, model the, their lives to to sermons that I preach, to the injunction that I place in, in all of those, uh, you know, my expectation doesn't really go through the roof. In fact, when it happens that somebody is trying to model something that I've said in a sermon, it surprises me probably a lot more than it surprises you. Like um, something that, that happened a few years ago in um, Wilson, the 
they hold a, a, an annual concert, a Music for Hope concert. They hold it at First Christian Church. We began it um, in, in my time there. And, um, and I suppose I'm thinking about this because actually um, this year's concert for, for this place that Linda is the executive director, the benefit, is going to take place uh, two days from this recording. It, it's uh, probably two days uh, past the time that you will hear this uh, sermon. Anyway, um, maybe that's why I really uh, have music uh, for hope in my mind uh, right now. But anyway, it was several years ago, maybe the, the first year after Linda's mother had moved to Wilson to be near us, and there were people from all over the community, from churches um, all over Wilson that were ambling into the sanctuary and taking their seats there. And Linda was was running all over uh, the facilities, checking on how uh, the reception was coming together in the fellowship hall and confirming speaking parts for her board members as they began to arrive, um, doing all of the things that you do when um, the event that is about to begin <laughs> is actually your event. She was busy kind of moving around. Anyway, a few moments before the concert um, uh, began, her mother, uh, Elaine, walked into the sanctuary and found a seat. It was about two-thirds of the way back um, in, in the, the pews in that sanctuary. Uh, and so the event began, and, and I actually had the responsibility of opening um, the, the moments with prayer, and I did that. And then I began to look around for uh, Linda, for her mother, um, and they weren't where I was expecting them where, where I had noticed Elaine earlier at the time, but instead they were actually up this time on the, on the third pew um, uh, on, on the right side, um, much, much closer. Uh, and, and after the concert, I learned what had happened. Linda whipped in um, to the sanctuary and she located her mother sitting near the back. And uh, she said, no, 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 no. Move up front, um, up here, up here on this third route. Move you up there. She said, you'll be able to hear better you're going to be able to see better. This is where you need to be. And so what happens there is Linda comes in and sees her, her mother sitting back there in those last few pews, uh, you know, with the riffraff that sits in those back pews and insists on moving them up, move, moving her up to a place where she's now sitting with the uh, church's aristocrats. Um, she had taken a lesser seat, but she got moved up into a more honored place. I guess what I'm saying is, it really wouldn't hurt the rest of you people to listen to me, to what I'm saying, and to try and put my words into action. Your lives might improve if you follow what I'm saying. Anyway, it, it just kind of surprised me that my mother-in-law knew um, that much uh, about Scripture. Who knew uh, that she knew how to handle those kinds of situations? Anyway, this little story that Luke gives us isn't really about where we sit in worship. Is of course a story about a sitting at a dinner engagement, and I suppose we've all had that kind of experience. We we go to some fancy sit-down affair, and when you get your name tag there, that's where you're going to discover which table you're at. And and you get that, that name tag, and you look at it, and you see it uh, to your horror, table number uh, 63. And um, uh, so you begin to move around the hall, and, and it's happened to me like that. And, and when I find the table, I... I will lean over to Linda and I'll say, man, you know, they put us with some old duffer who looks like he, he uh, can't even hear. We're going to have to be repeating ourselves all night long. And, and I don't know. There's several other people there. I think they're going to be gumming their food. Um, I, I don't know, all through dinner. And that's where my wife will pause and, and sort of give me the once over. And she will say something like, I imagine um, that's what they've been saying since uh, they saw that you were coming to sit at their table. Um, anyway, if I can be serious for a moment, and I don't know that I can, um, I, I, I um, will tell you this, that uh, I'll tell you what my experience has been in those situations. Uh, when I have been seated at, at table 63, I have met some of the most interesting people um, uh, and, and had some of the most charming conversations all with those people who've been seated with me at table 63. The key is, of course, not to judge people before you get to know them. And if and when you do make those inevitable judgments, as we will do, it helps if we bring a different set of evaluations 
to those inevitable judgments. Um, uh, the, a different set of, of evaluations that people are generally working with. And you know exactly what I'm saying here. It's not hard to figure out how the world judges you and, and me. We have an inkling about that. You see, on a scale from 1 to 100, I, I figure that I'm about a 70. I mean, it wouldn't even be that high if not for... Uh, Linda boosting me probably at least 10 or 15 points, but, but there I am, I, I think around a 70, college educated, a minister and a minister serving a, a fairly respected and, and significant congregation in the community, um, no outstanding warrants. Uh, so, you know, there I am, a 70, uh, maybe high 60s, I don't know. Um, uh, better than, than many people, better than, I think, convenience store clerks, better than used car salesmen, better than, than people who own laundromats, but not as good as, as bank presidents or not as good as physicians, not as good as business executives. And I am supposing that life has also shared with you exactly where you fit in this scale. Um, uh, you know, waiters, waitresses, uh, professors, and professors that are tenured, professors that are not tenured, public school teachers, uh, certified public accountants, wire directors, if I may say. And the point is, I know roughly where I fall on the scale, and so do you. And other people know where we fall on the scale. In fact, there is a fellow in Wilson that I know, and when I run across him um, just in some place, a grocery store or or something like that, some offbeat place, his interest in talking to me uh, might be quite high. Um, but it depends on where we run into each other. You know, a restaurant, he is some public place, we can have a very nice chat. But if we bump into each other at some higher class event, say uh, a, a Barton holiday reception at the, the president's house, um, I will see that while he's talking to me, he is surreptitiously glancing around the room to see if there's somebody um, else that, uh, that he can talk to, somebody who's better than me, seeing if he can take the 70 and move it up to an 85, maybe even a 90. Well, I hope that I have ha made this whole discussion crass enough that um, we can all agree that this is a terrible way for us to, to kind of interact with other people, especially to interact with them for the first time. The truth is, Generally speaking, people can be very, very interesting if we give them half a chance. I'm, I mean, uh, when we end up that, uh, uh, at, at, that, uh, at home that night after uh, sitting at table 63 for a couple of hours with folks, I may say to Linda, you know, that clown that was sitting next to me, he talked all night about canoeing in Canada. Um, but that might only beg the question of whether he actually was the least interesting person at the table. I mean, was I able to engage and to, to take in some things that maybe I had never taken in before so that by the end of the evening, I had learned uh, a few things, things that I hadn't known before about Canada or about canoes or about portaging small boats or what you do when, when you lose a paddle or whether um, you can paddle faster than a bear can swim or, or anything else. Was there anything that I was open to learning in that time at Table 63. I, um, I remember another incident that happened to me um, uh, uh, several years ago when I was getting my hair cut and, and I was sitting in the barber's chair only to be mesmerized by a conversation that was taking place there about who was the best taxidermist in Wilson, North Carolina. And apparently, of the six or eight people there that were getting their hair cut or waiting or, or cutting the hair, um, I was the only one who had nothing really to add to the discussion. One guy had just had a 10-pound bass mounted. And another guy told us that he had a bobcat running around on his property and he wanted to shoot it and have it mounted, but mounted with a rabbit hanging out of its mouth. Um, and uh, he didn't want to use the person that he had um, used the last time he had an animal mounted because she didn't do a very good job on that last kill of his. And I came home 
and knowing nothing about the subject, I looked up taxidermy on Wikipedia. And you see, um, uh, I did it because I needed to educate myself uh, a little bit or else I was going to just have to start letting my hair grow into a, a ponytail. If I was going back there, I needed to know something for that kind of discussion. Um, and maybe you know all of this, friends, um, that uh, in addition to the traditional skin mount and freeze-dried techniques, there is an increasingly popular um, reproduction mount that is being used uh, these days. And it isn't even real taxidermy, I, I understand. It's recreating an animal's looks by, by photos and by taking uh, careful measurements and then creating a model out of uh, resin or, or fiberglass. Uh, and so um, reading through all of that I could learn about taxidermy, I resolved right then and there that I would never do that. I would never have some sort of fake animal hanging on a wall in my den. Only real animals, or you know, animals at least that used to be real. Uh, my point, if I can remember it, and, and who knows if I can, my point is that, that people can be kind of interesting, even in offbeat kinds of ways, if you just give them a chance. Now, I know that the action of this parable isn't really about how um, we avoid people that we have deemed to be uninteresting. It's about how we react to people that we deem to be not as good as we are. Jesus comments on the sort of people who make up the guest list on this dinner that he is attending. Now, I read once that in the, the this gospel, this is the third um, dinner invitation that Jesus accepts from a Pharisee, and I checked it out um, just this past week. It's true. Uh, I've been checking it out. The first was in the seventh chapter where Jesus is anointed by the sinful woman who pours the perfume on him and washes his feet with her tears. And then the second um, meal with Pharisee takes place in the 11th chapter where Jesus is criticized for diving into the food without first washing. And then there is um, this meal where Jesus determines that there were folks um, like me, I suppose, who um, not only didn't get assigned 63, but people like me who didn't even get invited at all. And invite the poor, he says. Um, invite the poor and all of those people who won't ever be able to repay you and reciprocate. Now, by now, I have so confused myself that I'm um, not sure I have the least idea about what this story even means. But if I were to make a guess, um, I think it might be that we need to be careful about how we judge people. Do not judge, and you will not be judged, Jesus tells us, eight chapters earlier than where we read this story. But, you know, we do judge, um, and honestly, we have to. How can we chart our own way? How can we raise children? How can we um, uh, be, be guided in our living if we don't make some decisions about life around us? Uh, how can we steer our own lives without making judgments? I think instead what Jesus is, is after in all of this is to say, when you judge, be darn careful because most of us haven't demonstrated much competence in the matter. We judge on all the wrong criteria we look at money and status and, and how much education people have and, and we look at the kinds of clothes that they wear and, and how well they speak. They, there have been many studies uh, de demonstrating how good-looking people are more successful than plain-looking people. We, uh, meaning almost all of us, tend to judge people on all of the wrong criteria, including how we judge ourselves. What number did I give myself? A 70. Would I be surprised if I discovered that Jesus said, no, um, no, Gary, you're being a little generous about yourself there. I have you down as an 11. And that is really on a very, very good day for you. Well, you know, sure, I'd be shocked to get a, a score like that. Um, as I have that master's degree and I'm the minister of a, 
of a fine congregation, and, and I uh, have no outstanding warrants. But Luke seems to be absolutely sure that Jesus doesn't judge as the world judges. And I'm not just talking about um, judgments like social standing. I'm talking about how Jesus judges goodness and um, who is good and who is not good. Who is righteous and who is not righteous? Who was by every standard the world would have judged a very good and righteous person. And it's revealed by, by um, who he invites to sit at the table with him. I would say, um, do not judge, but of course you and I will judge. And for the sake of Jesus, let us experiment, though, with some different criteria for the way we do our judging. God, help us. God, bless us. Amen.
when I was a child, somebody gave me the book, You Are Special by Max Lucado. It's a beautiful children's story about small wooden people called Wemmicks who live together in a village. Every Wemmick has two boxes of stickers, a box of gold stars and a box of gray dots. And they spend their days walking up to other Wemmicks and putting stickers on them. The most beautiful Wemmicks get stars, the ugly ones with chipped paint get gray dots. And Wemmicks in between might get a mix of both. Those Wemmicks worry every day what kind of sticker they're going to get. One day, a particular Wemmick walks up near the wood workshop of Eli, the craftsman who had made all of the Wemmicks in the village. And standing there outside the workshop, he sees a Wemmick that he has never seen before. Not only has he not seen this particular Wemmick, he's not seen a Wemmick who ever has looked like her because she has no stickers on her. It was so beautiful that he just had to walk up and put a gold star on her arm, which promptly fell right off into the dirt. A little upset by this, he took out a gray dot and stuck that on her arm. And that too fell off. Eventually, the confused little Wemmick goes to speak to Eli, the woodcarver. He learns that that Wemmick, without any stickers, spends time every day with Eli. And every day, Eli would tell any Wemmick who cared to come and to listen that it didn't matter what the other Wemmicks thought. All that mattered was what Eli thought. And Eli thought that they were pretty special. And he would tell them, I think that you are special, not because you are beautiful, not because you are smart, but because I made you. And the more the Wemmicks listened to Eli, the less they worried about what the other Wemmicks thought, and the more the stickers just started to fall off. There is no high place or low place at Jesus' table because each person is welcomed here by Jesus, not because of what we look like, not because of how smart we are, but because we have been made by God and we are deeply loved by God. Come to this table and receive this gift. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that Jesus opened the way for us to join you. We thank you for these symbols of bread and cup, which remind us of how much you love us, even in the most difficult of times. As we take these symbols of your body and blood, help us to become more like you and represent you wherever we are. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we remember the story, how on that night in the upper room, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks for it and broke it, saying, this is my body that was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Thanks be to God. And now with gratitude for the gifts we have received at this table, let us offer together the prayer Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Receive now this benediction. Hear these words of God spoken through the prophet Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flames shall not consume you. Wherever you go, Whatever you do this week, may you feel God's own hand leading you. Go in peace, friends. It's a gift, as always, to be together in this time of worship. We invite you to share this message with others in your community. We are grateful for this time of worship.